continue in worship in the Lord, the next song we're going to sing is called, He Will Hold Me Fast. He Will Hold Me Fast. I got introduced to this song when I was visiting Mark Dever's church in, at uh, Capitol Hill Baptist in D.C., and um, it was a powerful song, and I, so I wanted us to sing it as a congregation, and this, uh, some portions of scripture here from Psalm 62 will help prepare our hearts for this song. Truly my soul awaits for you, God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. In verses 5 to 8, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God, is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and the refuge, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is our refuge for us. And so let's sing unto the Lord. He will hold us fast.
I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we take a second look at this chapter together and the use of spiritual gifts, the use of spiritual gifts. I'm going to read verses 12 through verse 30 <clears throat> and then ask the Lord to bless our time together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 to 30. Let's hear the word of the Lord together. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would, the, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No. Much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and are members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret. Father, I pray that you will take these words that we just read and you would use them to edify the body of Christ, glorify your holy name, give us that which we need to become the people you want us to become. You would help me uh, to deliver your word, give everyone ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand the truth of thy word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you, and I pray that this uh, passage is a blessing to your life. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but I have many times in my life, I've experienced pain in one part of my body that caused the other part of my body to react to that pain. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, but many times when I used to do construction work or when I would be working on a, on a construction site, I would step on a nail that was on a board. If I wasn't careful, I would step on a nail. Then all of a sudden, the rest of my body would react to that, to that pain that was in my foot. Or maybe you can experience this where you've maybe been in the kitchen and you were cooking some food and you forgot to put the mitt on your hand when you went to go grab something that was hot, right? And, there, and your, your body reacted to that. You felt it, but the rest of your body is reacting to that pain, that is, whether it's in your hand or in your foot. 
And I, I came across this article uh, that tells us how the body reacts to pain, and I thought it was fascinating because this is what Paul is talking about in these verses that we're looking at. Um, the question is, how does the body respond to something hot? Or how does the body respond to some kind of pain that you step on something on your foot or you stub your toe or something of that nature? Um, it, it talks about this little article that I had here. It, it, divide, it, it gives us a little bit of a history of uh, oh, how the body is broken up. Uh, we have two parts to our nervous system. I'm not sure how accurate this is. I was reading this to Wesley, and, and he showed me a diagram that uh, showed it was more than two parts. But the two parts that were divided here, it says that there's a central nervous system and there's a peripheral nervous system. And the central nervous system is made up of the spinal cord and the brain, while the peripheral nervous system is everything else, right down to the pain sensors in your big toe. And these two systems work together to basically control everything you and I do. Now, as you and I know, he says here, that the brain is where all the decisions are made, right? This includes both the conscious decisions that we make, like moving your hand to pick up your cell phone, and the unconscious ones that you make, like uh, increasing your heart rate when you're exercising. You, we're not thinking about that. It's just happening, right? The peripheral nervous system is responsible, it says, for carrying out these actions. These are complete through motor neurons, which move your hand or stimulate the muscles of the heart, uh, the, and the sensory neurons, which tell you that you're done. You've had enough, okay? So what's, what's the difference about how your hand or your foot responds to something that is hot or painful? How does the body react? Put simply, it says this. Reaction to sensing something like a hot plate doesn't go through the brain. As it turns out, the most complex and sophisticated thing known to mankind isn't up to the task of dealing with a simple hot plate. So the brain is not up to that task it's saying. Why? Listen to this. It's not quick enough. The brain would not respond quick enough according to research published in this article called The Brain. All right? So while you might think that your mind works pretty quickly, and it does because of its incredibly complexity, and he says that there are, there are, are as many as 100 trillion connections in the human in the human brain. Simple tax, task can take longer than they should. In the case of a potential hazardous scenario, every nanosecond, and I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, counts. And he says this, and this is what is introducing a part of our body on our nervous system that helps us. That's why the reflux arc, as, as it is known, bypasses the brain. So where is that decision that is made if you touch something hot or you step on something that's painful, where is that decision made? It says here that that decision is made in the spinal cord. It is made in the spinal cord. Normally, nerves of the peripheral nervous system feed into the re relatively safety of the spinal cord where they travel up to the brain, and once the brain has decided upon a response, different nerves carry that response back down the spinal cord and out to the relative area. In the case of the reflux arc, however, the nerve goes into the spinal cord and the stimulus of s is of such a magnitude that small neurons called interneurons realize that action needs to be taken immediately and feed the response straight back into the motor neurons of the peripheral uh, nervous system and the action, necessary action is carried out. You know what it's saying there? The brain wouldn't respond fast enough. So God designed our bodies in such a way that there's this thing called the reflex arc that's on our spinal cord that would cause, it's, it's programmed by God that when we touch something hot or some kind of painful thing happens in another part of our body, that decision is made in our spinal cord and it causes that immediate reaction. Boom, all of a sudden we react to it. Now, could you imagine just for a moment if that didn't work, if that part of the body wasn't working, you would grab something hot and you would be like burning your hand off because it says, ah, that's that stupid hand again. 
and it decides not to respond, and then next thing you know, you've got unbelievable consequences. Or your foot, you step on a nail, and you're just standing there on a nail, not even reacting to it. Could you imagine if that took place like that? Our bodies are not designed to do that. Our bodies constantly respond to those different things because God has designed our body to do that. Every member of our body is important, even the ones we can't see. Listen to this. We have parts of our body that we can survive without. Is that not true? There's parts of our body that we can survive without. But our bodies won't function in normal capacity. Some other part of our body is probably going to compensate for that part of the body that is not functioning the way it ought to. And there are also parts of our body that we cannot live without. That if we were to not have a certain part of our body, we would not be able to live. And guess what? It is those parts of the body that you and I can't even see. But they're vital. And I say all of that, and I didn't want to just try to impress you with that article and all that stuff, but I said all of that because our bodies are unbelievably just fascinating, are they not? God designed our bodies. And in this text of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, Paul is going to use our human body to say, hey, this is how the body of Christ is supposed to function. If one part, one member of the body of Christ is not doing its part, it's kind of like, you know, that, that part of the body, our human body, that's not reacting to something hot or stepping on something that's painful. It's, it's not healthy. It's not good for the rest. Something is going to go wrong. Something is not operating the way it's supposed to operate because someone in the body is not doing what they were called to do, is not doing what God has gifted them to do. And that's what Paul is talking about in these verses of Scripture that we are studying together this morning. God wants us to know, every one of us, listen to this, there are no nobodies. There are no nobodies in the body of Christ. There are no nobodies. Every member of the body of Christ as you sit here this morning, every member is gifted by God. God has given you a spiritual gift, and every member is needed for the body of Christ to function properly. And when one or more of those parts of the body, those members of the body, are not doing their part, well, the whole body is going to suffer because of that. And it's going to cause other parts of the body to compensate for the lack of of the other part of the body that is not doing its part. And that's what we're looking at this morning. So if you have your copy of the Bible, uh, look over at verse 12. As Paul begins this section of Scripture, verses 12 and 13 are kind of like a, our hinge verses. They divide these, this section of Scripture up from chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And the key words that we saw in, in verses 1 through 11, over and over again, Paul mentioned the words spirit or the same spirit, the spirit of God over and over again. And then when we get to verses 12 and 13, these are real uh, saturated with theology. But after we leave those two verses, you won't see the word spirit again. But over 16 times, you're going to see the word body, body. The function is going to be on the, our body or the body of Christ. So let's look at this verse 12. He says, for, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is also Christ. So you can see it right there if you look at it. Over and over again, he's talking about, he's emphasizing that word one. There's only one body of Christ. Universally all over the world, from the four corners, right, of the earth, there is one body of Christ. One body. The body of Christ cannot be divided up into many parts or many um, bodies, I should say. There is only one body of Christ. But as you see there, it says that there are also many members. Many members make up that one body. And so, in your minds, think about this. There's two concepts that explain the body of Christ. This is a little bit theolo theological, but I know you can get this. 
There's the universal body of Christ, which is made up of every born-again believer throughout the world. You can go, and we got some of those countries representing right here in our church right now, back in their homelands, right? Whether you be the Philippines, the Haiti, all over the world, right? You have believers gathered together, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. This is what the Bible talks about as the universal body of Christ, made up of every elect person who's been chosen by God to be in the body of Christ. And someday, the wonderful picture of Christ going to the four corners of the earth and gathering his elect together together to worship him, that they're all going to be together in heaven someday. That's a picture of what's going to happen for you and me. We're going to be a part of that grand phenomenon where, where Christ gathers all the members, each member of his body that is scattered all over the earth, and we're going to be in heaven worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the universal body. But the other aspect of that is the universal body is seen on the earth by the various local churches that gather under the name of Jesus Christ. So as you sit here this morning, if you've been united with Christ through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part of that one body, the universal body of Christ. Our union or our communion with Christ and his universal body is meant, designed by God to be lived out, to be lived out in commitment and communion with the local expression of that body. That's how the body of Christ is known. So listen to this. Jesus wants the world to know who belongs to him and who doesn't. Jesus wants the world to know who belongs to him and who doesn't. And here's my question. How is the world to know who belongs to him and who doesn't? The answer is they are seen. That is seen by people who publicly identify with his people in the visible public institution he established called the church. There, the world are to look at the members of his church. And if some people claim to be part of the universal church, which is scattered all over the earth, even though they belong to no local church, they reject God's plan for them and his church because Jesus intends for his people all over the world, to be marked out as a visible public group, which means joining together in local churches. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 12. The body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so it is with Christ. Christ has one body. His body, his body, there can't be more than one body of Christ. There's only one body of Christ, but it's universally seen, it's visibly seen, as the local church is gathered, and today, as you sit here this morning, if you, are, if you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part of that wonderful, visible body, local body of Christ. Now, how, how, are, people, how are people joined to that body? How are they joined? Well, verse 13 tells us, he says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink of, of, of all been made to drink into one spirit. So this is, verse 13 is a little bit more theology again. If you look at your scripture there, you see the word baptize. Uh, every, every time you see the word baptize, for the most part, it's talking about water baptism, that, that we ought to, after you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you follow the Lord in the, in, the, in the waters of baptism. But here in verse 13, that word baptize is not talking about water baptism. It's talking about spiritual baptism. That you and I, as believers, when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God baptizes us or places us in to the body of Christ. But not only does the, the Spirit of God baptize us or place us into the body of Christ, the Spirit of God also fills each one of us individually 
as it says there in verse 13, that we've been made to drink into one spirit, meaning the spirit of God has filled us. We've been immersed in the Holy Spirit, each individual person. So the moment you turn from your sin and you place your faith in the Lord Jesus to save you, you're baptized by the Spirit of God, and you're placed into the body of Christ. You're no longer of this world, but now you are in Christ. A wonderful thing has taken place. Now, there is some controversy about this verse in verse 13. Uh, Some believers of the charismatic nature or the Pentecostals that we might know, they're our friends, but they look at this verse and they teach what is known as a, a teaching called the second blessing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, another act of grace that God puts upon the believer. So think of it this way. Whatever date it was that you turned from your sin and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the scriptures teach and that verse teaches that the moment that happens, the Spirit of God baptized you and placed you into the body of Christ and, and also filled you So you you have all of the Holy Spirit the moment you trust Jesus Christ. You don't get some now or whenever that date was when you trusted in Jesus, and you get some later. You're tracking with me. Just nod your heads. We'll get done faster. All right? Pentecostals and Charismatics believe that when a believer puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the evidence of of that Spirit's baptism is that they begin to speak in tongues or they have some kind of miraculous gift that they're able to do That separates them and gives them evidence that they have the Holy Spirit living in them. And it's called a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. So you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Later on down the road, as you surrender to the Lordship of Christ, that Spirit comes upon you and you begin to speak in tongues or some kind of miraculous thing takes place. And they base that on Acts chapter 2. You know, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down and people began to speak in the tongues. They're saying that every time... You are placed into the body of Christ. You should be able to speak in tongues and some kind of miraculous thing. So that's what they believe. Now, I have a lot of problems with that. As you know, I don't believe that. Right? And if you're here, if you're a member of Calvary Baptist, you would sign our doctrinal statement. That's not in our doctrinal statement. We don't hold to that teaching, that second blessing of the Holy Spirit. And there's reasons why uh, we don't believe in it. Now, there's, first of all, this text is not teaching that. Secondly, the reason why we don't believe in it is because it's dangerous. It really is dangerous. Now, consider this for a moment. Let's say you do believe that. You got saved. You trusted in Jesus Christ. And you don't have all of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're you're waiting. You're searching. You're praying and asking for the second blessing of the Holy Spirit, and you're longing for it. So what happens? Well, the problem is it never comes. It never comes. And so you're searching for something that's never going to come to you. The second problem is you're not able to enjoy the Holy Spirit that God has given you right now because you're looking for something that's never going to happen. God wants you to know this morning that you have all of the Holy Spirit living in you. God has filled you with the Holy Spirit. Now, now does that mean that... that uh, You can't have some kind of experience of the filling of the Holy Spirit, controlling of the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't mean that. You have all of the Holy Spirit, but here's the question for you this morning. Does the Holy Spirit have all of you? That's something you need to think about. What is lacking in our experience as Christians is not that we need more of the Holy Spirit. We have all of the Holy Spirit. What is lacking in our life is, listen, full obedience. We're not fully obeying the Lord. We're not fully trusting the Lord. We're not fully submitting our lives to the Lord. And therefore, when we don't fully trust and fully submit and we don't have full, complete obedience, we're not experiencing the Holy Spirit the way God wants us to because it's not that we don't have all of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have all of us. Amen? Or, oh, me. We need to pray about that, and we need to make some decisions in our life. Why why is that true? Why do I not submit like I ought to submit? What's, What's stopping me? What's holding me back from completely giving my life to the Lord so that I have this full experience of the Holy Spirit using my life in a a great, miraculous way. And the the, the answer is simple, and we all know the truth. 
We love sin more than we love God. All of us struggle with that, including your pastor, because I still have sin in my life. And sometimes the world seems more, more appealing to me. And so what do I do? Oh, I know what I do. I fight it. I fight the good fight of faith, and I I lay hold of what Christ has for me. Every day, I pursue what God has for me. Do you do that? Do you pursue what God has for you? He will hold you fast. He will not let go of you. He will not let go of me, but you let go of Him. Are you not submitting yourself completely to the Lord? The the Holy Spirit wants to do wonderful things in your life and my life. As you look at that verse 13, he wants us to also understand that the body of Christ is diverse. It's so beautiful, right? There's not one nationality. There's not one people that kind of owns this thing called Christianity. Look at it in verse 13 there. It says, uh, we've all been baptized in this one body, whether you're a Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free. We've all been made to drink of the Holy Spirit. We've all been able to experience the Holy Spirit. And you can even add to that. Excuse me. Not only not only uh, Jew or Greek or slave or free, black, white, rich or poor, it don't matter. It's it's level at the foot of Christ at the cross. We can all worship Him. We can all praise Him. Amen. We all can experience the wonderful beauty of the Holy Spirit working in our life. He's baptized us into Christ. He's filled us, and the question is, does He have complete control of our lives? And that's what's missing. The Holy Spirit having complete control of our life. So we're not lacking any blessing. If you come across another believer that believes that, just pat them on the back and just love upon them and don't make a big issue out of it. All right? You can get into a big debate. It's not even worth it. Now, verse 12 and 13 is the meat, right? Now he's going to break all this down here in verses 14 all the way down to verse 27. I want to summarize it for you. All right? I've already read it. All right? I want to summarize what he's saying here for us to get a good handle on the use of spiritual gifts in the church. There's there's reasons why uh, the Corinthians were struggling, right? And there might be some different reasons here in our in our congregation, but there were reasons why they were struggling with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'll, I'll lay out for you what these verses are saying. Three three things. First of all. Some people don't serve the Lord or use the gifts of the Holy Spirit because they have a sense of inf- inferiority. I said that word right, inferiority. I, I was struggling with it all week. I was working on it. I got it right? Inferiority. Oh, that's good. I just want you guys to smile and laugh a little bit. You know, have a little fun on me. It's okay. You can do that. All right? So there's a sense of infi- inferiority. That I, 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 uh, I feel inadequate. How many here, maybe ha- you don't have to raise your hand, but I bet you in your heart and mind, at times you feel inadequate. You, you, you have that sense of inferiority where, where you don't feel that you're needed. And so you see that there in verses 15 to 16, that phrase is used over and over again. If the foot should say, because I am not of the, a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? It says the same thing in verse 16, that, that the thought that I am not of the body of Christ. So a person would not think that they're of the body of Christ, that, that no one really needs me. I'm inadequate. And so the problem in the Corinthian church was that they were emphasizing the more showy spiritual gifts. You know, everybody in the, in the Corinthian church wanted to speak in tongues, right? He bought a necktie, she bought a Hyundai. He bought a necktie, she bought a Hyundai, right? They all wanted to speak in tongues and all they wanted to prophesy. They wanted to be, you know, up in front and doing those things. But listen, if everybody spoke in tongues and if everybody was prophesying, What about the rest of the the church wouldn't function? It wouldn't function. And so because they were emphasizing these these showy gifts, Paul is trying to get them to see that what they're doing is they're creating an atmosphere in the congregation of other believers who are not able to speak in tongues, who are not able to prophesy because God didn't give them that gift. Well, they have the gift of helps. (laughs) Too bad. Go over there. They have the gift of administration. Oh, too bad, right? And so I, I, they feel I am not needed. Now, I want you to know here this morning at Calvary Baptist Church, if you don't serve the Lord here at Calvary because you don't feel like you're needed, I don't know what planet you're on, number one, because you're not getting that from this pulpit. You are needed. 
You are needed. Do you say, do you hear that? Say it to yourself. I am needed. I am needed. I am important. Don't feel inadequate. Don't feel like you're not needed. God wants you to know this morning that you are needed. God wants you to know that there are no nobodies in the church. There are no nobodies. Every gifted person, you are needed. Now, I, again, have provided for everyone to have um, a spiritual gift in inventory. If you have not taken that survey, it asks you a number of questions to help you, help you to discern what your spiritual gift is. And so if you don't know what your spiritual gift or spiritual gifts are, make sure you go through that survey. Take a little time. It takes about 10 minutes to do. Go through it, and you'll learn what your spiritual gift is so that you can serve in the church. And if you're wondering, what, what are the needs here at Calvary Baptist Church? I've also got a little insert. I put it back there in the foyer. And we're going to have the newlyweds out there in the foyer again at the end of the service with the clipboards. And they were holding those clipboards, and they could not contain themselves. Guess what they did? They signed up. Both of them signed up, right? So they both want to do some kind of serving. Now it's our job as leaders now to get them plugged into different aspects of serving the Lord. But please, as you walk out here this morning, make sure you sign on that list saying, I want to serve. Maybe you have uh, something that from the insert that helps you know where you ought to be serving. Now as we continue looking at these verses, I want you to picture, if anybody here ever watched a cartoon, kind of a movie called Monster, Inc.? Isn't that the coolest thing, right? One of the guys in that cartoon, I forgot his name. I think his name is Mike. I'm not sure. And he's, all he has is one big eye, right? He's just, you know, can you imagine if the whole church was one big eye? That's what it says here in verse 17. If the whole body, that's what made me think of it when I was reading this. If the whole body were an eye, I'm sorry, just pray for me. I think of crazy things when I'm reading scripture, all right? Is the air conditioner on or is it just me hot? It's hot? Can you... Help me out back there. All right. Whenever I see, I think it's, uh, some, I see someone over here going like that, I know it's getting hot. All right. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Smelly. Smelling. So what he's saying there is, listen, the, the church is not all, all one gift, gifted individual. It's not all an eye. It's not all an ear. It's so there's not just me as the preacher, and then no, nobody else has a spiritual gift. Like, it's not saying that, that the church is designed so that the pastor does all the work. If that, that's, the church wouldn't function properly if that's the way it was. But no, look at the next verse. Verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. God has designed the body of Christ. Everyone has a spiritual gift. No one just has one, has no, there's not to be one person doing all the work. You, you and I come here every Sunday morning. You're able to sit down and enjoy the worship service, hear the sermon, hear, sing the songs. But do you realize that there's people who are getting that ready for you to do? For you to enjoy. People are doing things so that you can sit down and relax and enjoy. And that's great. We want you to. We want you to be ministered to so that you would minister to someone else. Amen. And so, but if everyone is just taken, 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 church is going to be not functioning properly. It's like just having an eye or just having an ear, right? It's not supposed to function that way. And worse of all is that, I have no idea where I am on my notes, but it's okay. Worse is this, we're being disobedient. We're being disobedient because God God has placed each one of us in the body with a particular gift so that the body functions properly properly. So when you or I, for whatever reason, fail to use the spiritual gift for the benefit of the body of Christ, we are basically telling God, I don't like the way you made me. I don't like the gift you gave me. I don't want to use the gift you gave me. We're being disobedient. John MacArthur has a way of putting words. Listen to what he says here. He says, a Christian who does not have a ministry is a contradiction. A Christian who does not have a ministry in the church is a contradiction. He or she is disobedient and denies God the right to use him. So when we're not allowing God to use, we're denying God the right to use us. Those are powerful words. 
and for which he has gifted him. When we refuse to follow God's will and God's plan, we deny his authority and lordship as well as his wisdom and goodness. If you're not serving in some capacity, you're denying God's authority over your life, his lordship over your life, as well as you're questioning his wisdom, you are questioning his goodness. Let's not be that way. We need everyone. Now, you and I know in our, our regular physical bodies here that our hands and our feet and every part of our body besides our head does not have a will. Right? The, the hand doesn't tell the head what to do. Right? It, it just does what the head tells it to do. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to function. You and I are just hands. We're feet. Right? Uh, you're, you and I are not the head. The head is the one that has the will. God is sovereignly and his will has placed you here at, at Calvary. And every person who's been placed in the body of Christ sovereignly placed you there. He's the one who tells us what to do. The hand cannot tell the head, I'm not going to do that. No, we submit to the lordship of Christ. As you look here at your Bibles, and verses 20 all the way to the end of this chapter, if I can summarize this again, if I were to summarize verses 14 to 19, I would summarize it by someone saying, I, I am not of the body, I am not needed. Therefore, that's why I don't, ser I don't serve. There's a sense of, of inferiority. And then in verses 20 to 30 can be summarized by someone saying this, because you are not one of the showy, gifty, gifted, um, better gifts, you're not needed. A sense of superiority. Let's read it and I'll show you. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No. Much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed, again, listen, the body having greater, greater honor to the part which lacks. Now, I'll stop right there for a minute. So what this is saying is that there's a sense of superiority. I have no need of you. Now, you wouldn't hear that from anybody in this church saying, uh, you, I don't have a need of you. But that, an atmosphere can be created in a church where if, if one person is able to do things better than anybody else, and they're, they're the ones that keep doing it, do it, doing it, and no one else works. In a sense, that's happening here because we have a few people doing all the work, right? And there's a sense that there's no need of anybody else to do anything. But well, that's not the way we want it to come across. And so if all of a sudden those ones who were doing all the work, right, would stop doing it, you would come to church and you would start complaining because things aren't getting done. And all of a sudden we would have divisions. It's, this is, there's this individualistic attitude that happens in the congregations all over the world that happens either in of, of, of a sense of inferiority where, where you, you, you're, you don't feel like anyone needs you and then you're feeling like, I, I just gonna, I'm just going to live my life over here, right? Individual. Or I'm superior over anybody else. I have the best gifts. I can do anything better than you. I don't want to delegate anything. I'm just going to go, 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 right? And, uh, and that's a sense of individualism. God doesn't want us to operate that way because God has placed you here in the body of Christ to serve and not just to be served and over and over again. And so those verses of Scripture that seem kind of hard to understand about how he's saying that there's, that there's, that there's um, weaker or, or necessary in verse 23, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, those we give greater honor, our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Just think of your own body, the way it's designed. There's certain parts of our body that, you know, we want... We, we want to be modest. We keep those parts of our body covered. That's what he's talking about there. There's other parts of our body that are always being seen by people, right? There's no, there, there's no need for them. And there's other parts of the body that should be um, seen and doing things. And that's what it's saying here. God has given greater honor to the parts that lack it. Why is God doing all this? Well, 
he ends it by saying this. The reason why God is doing this, verse 25, that there should be no schisms, no divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. God doesn't want the body to be divided by, by this attitude of inferiority or superiority where individualism is, is, is ruling the church. And he doesn't want people to, re, to, to, to live that way, but he's designed the body so that there'll be no divisions and that we would have the same care for one another. That we would have the same care. And this, then he gives an example. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. How do you feel when somebody in, at Calvary Baptist Church is hurting? We have some right now. Margarita and John. Have, John has lost his sister. Margarita's sister is almost she's on, a, on the deathbed. And they're suffering. How does that make you feel? It ought to bother you. It, you ought to feel some sense of pain because if one member of the body is suffering, ah, I stepped on a nail. Oh, I touched something hot. My rest of my body is reacting, right? We have people who can't come to church because they have depression, right? A list. Peter sent out a list of names that need to be visited. Lord, Please, burden someone's heart here at Calvary to look at that list again, get together a number of ladies to go and visit that individual and be a blessing to them. They want a visit. We have people who are hurting who can't make it, and they need a visit. Would you be that person to go and visit them? Because one part of the body is suffering. And the other thing is, the other side of that coin is when someone is being honored and, and, they're, and they're, they're being blessed and great things are happening in their life. We ought to rejoice when we see that. That's what he's saying here. There's a mutual care. This is what a healthy church looks like when we're ministering and serving each other because we all know what our spiritual gift is. And I love what he says in verse 27. It's almost like now. If you're doing these things, if one member suffers, we all suffer. If one is being honored, we all rejoice. Now, you are the body of Christ. And members individually. You are. Now you are. We got a long way to go. We're not there yet. We are the body of Christ by name, but we need to operate and we need to function with everyone need using their spiritual gifts, and that will make us a healthy church. You are the body of Christ. So let me end the message this morning by just leaving you some questions to think about. Is the church stronger because of you? Is the church stronger because of you? Uh, do you receive more ministry from the church than you minister to it? Do you receive more ministry from the church than you minister to it? That's not good. That's unhealthy. What kind of need is God going to fill with you here at Calvary Baptist? What kind of need is he going to fill? You're not just not here, right? Sovereignly placed you here. What kind of need is going to be filled? And is that, fill, is that need being filled right now? Is it happening? If not, pray specifically for God to reveal to you what your spiritual gift is. He's given you a spiritual gift, maybe more than one. Pray and ask God to reveal that to you. Take that survey that we have. Ask mature Christians who, you, who know you. They know what your strengths are. Would you ask them to help you? Look for open doors of opportunities to try different areas. Begin serving in the little things. Waiting on tables and feeding and, and um, setting up for the, for the different fellowships we have. And then God will begin to show you. If you look at the scriptures in 1 Timothy 3, it gives the qualifications for an elder, right? And then, and then a little bit down further, it gives the qualifications for deacons. And in the qualifications for deacons, that they serve, and as they're serving, they're being observed and watched. At a certain point, right, they could desire the gift of uh, the, 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 serve, the, the serve as an elder, but if they're not serving properly as a deacon, we would never consider them to be an elder. And in the same way, 
as you're serving in the church, if you're serving and you're heading in that direction to do all that God has designed for you to do, you will be noticed by, by the leadership as we see. And someday, you know, you might be ushering and then we might come up to you and say, you know, you've been serving faithfully. You're even discipling someone. Would you consider being a deacon or would you consider being an elder? Because we're watching and we're looking at, at the body of Christ. That's our job, to help raise us up to, to serve the Lord wherever the Lord has gifted us. And, and if we see you're gifted, you might not see that, right? But as we're observing you serve, we might come to you and say, you know, we, we see you have a gift here. We want to we ask you to pray about this and consider it. Keep that in, on, in your heart and mind. So God wants you to follow the desires of your heart. He, he's given you a desire to serve him. Would you pray about that? Would you begin to seek the Lord's will? And um, God will show you. God will reveal to you. God will lead you in your life as you take those steps of obedience. Again, what's the next step that God has for your life? Are you just standing still or are you taking that next step? Let's pray. Lord God, I, I come to you and I thank you for um, this wonderful time of worship in your word and the, uh, just the way you designed the body, the way you have brought us here at Calvary. And we're small, but Lord, you could do great things even the, in a small amount of people that we have. And, and, and if we're all doing our part, the body will begin to grow. And so I pray, God, that each one here today, if they're not serving, that they would ask you specifically to show them. And not just wait for the lightning bolt, but take that step and begin to serve in the little things. And little by little, you will reveal to them how you want them to contribute to the body so that the body is functioning the way it ought to. Oh Lord, I pray you make us healthy. I pray you grow us. Grow us, Lord, as each one does his part, does each one does her part. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, in his name's sake. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing to the Lord this morning. And if God's worked in your heart, you want to come forward and just kneel down here and pray. If you need counsel this morning, you come forward. God will, will get you the help that you need.